Oh gosh, Alan Friday, no longer with us in Britain, but my God, what a lot of work he's done. And he's a very, you know, a member of the BLS from long before I was. Gosh, Alan. <laughs> and um, so he's been looking at lichen communities in Montane, Britain. That was his first work with Oliver Gilbert and a PhD in uh, Sheffield, another great lichenologist. And so this was Alan beginning his work. But since 1999, of course, he's been a curator of the Lichen Collections at Michigan State University, from where he has continued to work in extreme habitats. So he's been in the Falklands, in southeast Alaska. So, Alan, I wonder how Scotland looks compared with that. But we look forward to your revisiting Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. I'm um, just going to try and share my screen. Not like that. That one. Here we go. Can you everybody see my screen? That's brilliant, Alan. Thank you. you. Yeah, Excellent. all good. Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody, for inviting me to participate in a British Lichen Society AGM for the first time in 15 years, it must be. I think it's just absolutely wonderful. And I hope the BLS can continue to do this in future years when hopefully we'll be back to having in person meetings there will be some way for remote members to participate again that would be absolutely brilliant so um lichens of the scottish mountains i'm first of all going to talk about the habitat the ecology of of the mountains and the lichens and then go on to talk about two or three um, specific mountains and the lichens that grow on them so why are they so special in a word climate as it's been mentioned by a couple of people, Andy earlier this morning, uh, Julie yesterday, the mountains of Scotland and the British Isles in general are in a highly oceanic position. They're stuck right on the western extremity of the continent and exposed to every Atlantic gale that comes in. Um, particularly with Scotland, they don't even, have, don't even have island in the way to give them a bit of protection. So the effects of an oceanic climate are numerous, but the two we're most concerned with here are low seasonal variation in temperature. That is, it doesn't get very warm in the summer, but it doesn't get very cold in the winter either. And high atmospheric humidity and precipitation. It rains a lot. And even when it's not raining, the air is still wet. There's still a lot of damp and humidity. To measure oceanicity, we divide the amount of precipitation by the annual temperature range and we get this map. As you can see, if my cursor will show up, there it is. Um, the west coast of Scotland is in this highly oceanic position. It's much more oceanic even than the extreme southwest of Norway and clearly much more oceanic than the rest of the UK. And when you get over to the Alps here, you're in a totally different climatic region. The other thing to notice from this map is how close together the lines are here. So it's got a very steep oceanic gradient as opposed to more continental areas where it's much more uniform. So we can look at the effects of the oceanic climate by looking at three areas in Scotland. Uh, the Coolin on the west, Craig Meggy in the Central Highlands and Loch Nagar in the Eastern Highlands. And if we look at the, <clears throat> the effect on the amount of uh, um, alpine environment, um, this is usually measured by the amount, the area above the tree line. Unfortunately, in the UK, you have a bit of a problem with that because we don't have much of a tree line because a lot of the trees have been cut down. So we have to use the upper limit of Coluna vulgaris, Heather, as a proxy. 
And you can see from this diagram uh, that even though the mountains in the east are a little bit higher in general, maybe 150 meters, because the upper limit of Kaluna Volgaris is so depressed by the um, oceanicity in the west, there's over five times more ocean um, alpine habitat to work with. The other effect of oceanicity is on a thing called water deficit, which is basically the difference between the water entering the system and the water exiting it via runoff, evaporation, etc. And this is usually a negative number. Um, I'm not quite sure how more water can leave a system and enters it, but it, that's what it says, and that's why ground is usually dry. However, in the Western Highlands, particularly in this area here around La Caba, we have a negative water deficit, which would most people would call it a surplus. But what it means in practical terms is the water is per the water, <laughs> the soil, the ground is permanently waterlogged. And this has a significant effect on the, the lichens. Uh, so in other words, it rains a lot. The summits of the Western Highlands, particularly in this area of around La Caba, which I talked about previous slide, can receive up to four meters of rain a year. Just think about that, four meters of rain, 12, 13 feet of rain in a year. That's a lot of water. If you imagine someone sat on a chair on top of one of the mountains, at the end of the year, they're gonna to be totally inundated under the water by quite a long way. So in more general terms, the Scottish climate of the Scottish mountains has been described as a combination of, oops, sorry, a combination of low temperatures, severe wind exposure, excessive precipitation, cloud and humidity, persistent winter frost and snow cover, deficiency of sunshine, poor visibility, continual ground wetness and low evaporation. Hmm. People don't like that sort of weather very much, but the lichens love it. So how does all this affect the lichens? Again, we'll look at two areas, Blavin in the west, Kengom in the east. The eastern highlands are to a large extent composed of granite, which gives you these nice rounded hills, a uh, smooth outline, rounded boulders, and a lot of uh, particulate matter, a little gravel in between these boulders, which when it wind blows, it whips across the the plateau and erodes most of the things off the boulders. So that a lot of these rocks and boulders you can see in the foreground here, there's very little growing on them. But what there is, is quite a few terriculous lichens and quite a few quite impressive um, macro lichens. Thing, and these are of national importance because this Cairngorm Plateau is the only place where these particular lichens grow. We have things like Flavia cetraria nivalis. This can be quite common. You can have actual mats of this stuff. It's quite impressive. Um, another one is Cladonia maxima. If you can see it in here, it grows in amongst the Nardus stricta. Um, it's actually a very good rep representation because it is actually very difficult to see amongst the Nardus. Another one which is much more easier to spot, although it's much rarer, is Alectoria ocraluca. Um, this is known from only a handful of sites in the Northern Cairngorms. The Western Highlands, in contrast, are often composed of schists or basalts, and they're much more angular. There's much more sort of scope for microhabitats, which give different niches for the lichens to inhabit. So you get a more wide ranging um, micro lichen um, biota on the rocks. Conversely, because the soils are so waterlogged, oops, going too far, you don't get many macro lichens. But the communities on the, on, the, on the rocks, on the pebbles, on the stones, on the summits, this is quite impressive 
and the, uh, the as you can see here um we have things up here this is the cydia camaculans rare species um not a true lucidia we have amygdalaria pilobotrion we have uh pulpidia tuberculosa that's what the book says anyway i'm not convinced it's the same as the pulpidia tuberculosa you get in the lowlands um you can't actually see it because it's underneath the um <laughs> the zoom thing but there's the crustose stereocoulon stereocoulon tonnensi on there as well so let's look at a few areas in scotland in particular this is ben jarag in the north um this is snowbed um uh, apologies to people who wanted to look at snowbeds i know it said i was going to deal with snowbeds but unfortunately it got cut because it just haven't got time they could do a whole talk on snowbeds um also notice here there's a wall going across the top of this mountain the scots were crazy how they built walls everywhere um so to get up to this snowbed i had to walk up this glen here i was walking i did two or three days walking up to this snowbed and i walked up and down this glen two or three times and on the final day i thought i wonder what's actually growing on these rocks in this stream and i waded out to it and found this thing which is protoparm iliopsis acariana or lecanora acariana in old money and before i found it here it was this was us was in ooh, mid 90s maybe um it was known from one site in the english lake district where there was a couple of phalli growing around a tarn here it was smothering rocks up and down this river for about a kilometer and here it is next to protopamelius protopamelioopsis muralis you see it's much more robust um, it's almost folios beautiful lichen Go a little bit further south, come to Ben A. Ben A is composed of Cambrian quartzite. There's a big lump of it here in the foreground. It's very hard, it's very smooth, and it's very nutrient poor. Um, so not much grows on it. It's quite good for Fosidias, but that's about it. Except on the very summits of the mountains is a stratum outcrop of a fucoi beds. Um, it says, oops, sorry, I thought there was more words coming. Um, the fuci beds, nothing to do with seaweeds. I guess someone thought it was going to, they look like seaweeds in the, uh, or the, um, fossils that are in the, in the stratum. Um, but it's very calcareous. So you get the actual summits of the mountains are actually quite densely vegetated and on them you get this beauty which is nephroma arcticum now unfortunately this photograph was taken in british columbia and the specimens we have in britain aren't quite so impressive as you can see here it was being grazed to death by a deer so i had this great idea of putting a couple of exclosure cages over some of the phalli and comparing what happened see if the protecting them from the deer would save them or if it would actually inhibit whether grazing was actually necessary to stop the grasses and the bryophytes overtaking the nephroma but how do you get an exclosure cage onto the top of a scottish mountain a thousand meters up uh, these things are heavy um and it wasn't going to be easy and i had this great idea hanging baskets from your local garden center they're perfect plastic coated you can hold them down with tent pegs um nice and tight together no animal is going to get its head through there so i stuck a couple of these things over a couple of um the fromer arctic phalli left them basking in the sunshine and went off to america unfortunately when someone went back to check on them about five years later the Scottish climate was a lot more harsh than we thought it was. Uh, not only has the cages been totally destroyed, 
but the lichen's gone as well. It's been totally overgrown by the grasses. But the lichen is still there. I think it is, as far as I know, it's still there in other places because it also grows over the dwarf willow, Salix herbacea, and that it's actually doing quite well. Finally, and at Moore, a bit further south near Fort William, we were doing a lichen inventory for the, of the Ben Nevis range, of which Annette Moore is part. And we knew this beauty uh, occurred there. This is Catalechia wallenbergii. This thallus is maybe two, three centimeters across. And we found it eventually right on top of the ridge up here. And we hunted around, but couldn't find any more. And so we worked our way down and we got down here and I looked across and I thought, well, that could be it down there. So, but it's uh, about a thousand feet, maybe a yeah, thousand feet sort of drop down here. So taking my life in my hands, I edged across this edge, got the things you do for lichens, eh? And got to here, and this is what the type of photograph I took. This is um, the biggest Catalogia Wallenbergi I found this I've ever seen in my life. It's the size of a dinner plate. It's probably 20, 25 centimeters across. And I think this is probably the most impressive lichens, one of the most impressive lichens I've ever seen. And I've seen some pretty impressive lichens in Southeast Alaska and the Falklands, but this I think tops the lot. Okay, in conclusion, I mean, this is just a brief, very brief tour of some sites. Um, whole play number of places I haven't even mentioned. And there's still lots more lichens to find up on the mountains. Uh, these two, Cladonia stellaris, Flavocetraria cuculata, these have actually been reported from the British Isles. There are old 19th century records of these. Cladonia stellaris has been reported from Glen Nevis. Uh, Flavocetraria cuculata has been reported from Bray Riak in the Cairngorms. But I think there's a considerable amount of doubt whether the material actually um originated from the uk certainly they haven't been seen for over 100 years but there's no reason at all why they shouldn't be there so that's something for people to go up the mountains and have a look for and there's also this thing which is arctopalmelia centrifuga i'm convinced i've seen this in the eastern quarries of benavud in the eastern cairngorms but I was on the way back from a long day's hike and I didn't have the time or the energy to hunt around and find a fertile specimen. And without apothecia, you can't be certain that it isn't just a luxurious Arctopalmelia in curva, which lacks apothecia but has ceridia. So it's a provisionally reported from the UK, but it's, I think it's there. So it's, I can tell people where it is if you want to go and have a look. So there's lots more to do, lots more to find. And I know I've gone on about how horrible the weather is, but it doesn't rain all the time. So get up the mountains and have a look for them. Thank you. Alan, that was absolutely spectacular. And it really does just make me want to book a trip to the Scottish mountains almost immediately. Your honestly, your commitment to this habitat is just so inspiring. And while I'm here, I just want to take the time to say uh, what an honour it is to meet you virtually. I have oh, heard thanks, just the most amazing stories about you. And um, yeah, hopefully I'll get to meet mm. you one day face to face. I so, always worry when people say they've heard all the stories <laughs> about me. All, all good, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a disappointment, actually. <laughs> So um, I'm still waiting for some questions to come in, but I guess while we're waiting for the influx, um, I can ask one. So have you seen any key changes um, within the Scottish mountains during your time whilst you've been studying them and learning about them? Um, given that I haven't been up a Scottish mountain for 15 years, um, <laughs> but even, even so, I mean, the Nefroma Arcticum, I talked about was very interesting, even in the short time. I first went up there in about 1990 with Oliver Gilbert and Brian Coppins. 
and then went back to monitor it. I actually had a monitoring project. Um, I actually went up there with great big sheets of plastic and put them down over the, the frome Arcticum colonies and drew around them in the marker pen. And I said, I did this in early 90s, went back in the late 90s and put my sheets of plastic back down over the, because I'd marked where the, where the quadrats were. And there was just no, nothing. There was no way of matching up what was there now to what was there five years previously. It was total turnover. Where there was lichen before, there was no lichen. And where there wasn't lichen, there was no lichen. It was so, yeah, these are, I mean, what people have said before, you know, these are very mobile communities. Mm. You know, you, the um, idea of lichens being slow growing doesn't always uh, apply, especially I think, as Andy was saying, in the, in the oceanic woodlands, the, uh, sorry, the Scottish rainforest. Um, <laughs> it's, um, these things grow and change so quickly. So, yeah, I mean, and from what I know of um, uh, how climate change is going to affect it, I mean, it's supposedly going to make it a lot wetter. So it's going to increase, this is what I've seen, is it's increasing bryophyte growth, which is um, crowding out the lichens, because the even though the lichens are fast growing, the bryophytes are growing even quicker. Yeah. That's brilliant, Alan. Thank you for that. So